So that brings up a question, Excellency, that uh, I don't want to embroil you in controversy. I only have two questions left, but I do think that we need your guidance and your wisdom and your prudence and your prayers when it comes to this idea that sometimes the frustration gets too much and there is a temptation to make the conclusion that this Francis can't be the Pope. And there's this idea that that's the most powerful thing I can say. He's not the Pope. I have argued, and I think you've argued, that to do that will only divide the most principled and organized opposition to the Synod, for example, to the Vatican in the world today. There's great unity right now in standing. And if we, bring, if we go down the road of declaring Francis not the Pope, we divide that opposition, and we also leave ourselves in a, in a no man's land um, but we need guidance because there's, there is a, many good people say, well, he just can't be the Pope. And I wonder if just in a, in a, in a nutshell, in a few moments, if you could give us some, some advice on that. How do we avoid that pitfall? Yes. This is simply we have to regain the supernatural view. This reaction is too human, too like in a party or in a or human organization these people who are reacting. And the second, that the Pope is not identical to the entire church, no. We have to believe the church is greater than a single Pope. The church is more, more strong, That's That's stronger it. than That's a it. single Pope. And the, the faith of the Catholic Church is the faith of all the saints, of all the Popes. It is still valid, it is still in power and a single pope can only obfuscate darken for a short time this because a single pope is not eternal he is short and the next point the church is not in our hands no the church is always in the hands of our lord jesus christ so we have to, to state this, always. So, when Peter, the Apostle Peter, three times he denied Jesus Christ, this was an act even of apostasy in some way, Apostle Peter. Our, our Lord publicly in front of the Apostles appointed him, you are Peter, and upon you I will build my church. And then, uh, when he uh, denied Christ, he did not lose his appointment, in no way. He repented, and then, uh, when he was then in prison, uh, all the church prayed for him, and God sent an angel who freed Peter from the chains. We can see this also spiritually. Now the Pope is in a spiritual prison. He is imprisoned, in, he is blinded, he, he is becoming, became a supporter of all this worldly globalist agenda and of all this doctrinal and moral relativism. He became a, a supporter of this. And this is so uh, a great blindness. He is in chains. And we have to do it as the first church did, pray to, to free the Pope from these chains. And they may God send an angel also to Pope Francis, why not? To free him from these spiritual chains. Let us do this. So this brings me to my, my last question for you. I know it's pretty late over there, in the middle of the night, I think, or almost. Um, and it has to do with the crucifixion of the mystical body of Christ that I think we are all witnessing at this point, this tragic moment in history. If you could, if you could share some ideas about how scandalized the early Christians must have been when they saw our Lord who, the man who said he was God, who was God, die on the cross, seemingly be vanquished, be conquered by his enemies, and yet they kept the faith. Can you give us some spirit, as we close our conference, can you give us some spiritual advice 
on how we must emulate that and how now as the mystical body of Christ is crucified, how do we go forth <laughs> into this world and do as, as the early Christians did, not be scandalized, live on to the third day and to keep the faith? Yes, because the, the church is the mystical body of Christ and is now enduring also um, its uh, crucifixion, Golgotha, and we have to have this really unshakable faith of Our Lady. Let us look on Our Lady. She was under the cross, faithful. She did not fear no one. Because of her faith and, and immense love for her Divine Son. And Our Lady, she believed in the victory of Christ. When she was looking on, upon Him on the cross, she was believing. And so we have to ask Our Lady this, this strong faith that God will win, triumph through this suffering of the, His Church. He permitted this unprecedented crisis on the top of the Church because he wants to give to the church a greater good. This can only God. And he will, after this crisis, the church will again reflourish. Then will come a time of a kind of spiritual springtime, as always after crisis. And maybe not in these big sizes and measures of the church, maybe smaller, but uh, pure, purified. So, and uh, there was an apparition in Quito in the 17th century, Our Lady of the Good Success called. And there Our Lady uh, said to, sister, to the, the abbess, Sister Mariana, she spoke about the power of the enemies in the church. And then she said, and after the suffering of the church, the church will again have the, the shape of a young, beautiful girl. So, this we have to hope, and we have the privilege that we are put by God in this difficult time to do also our contribution, even small, with our su sufferings, with even what we are observing. It's a suffering. Let us offer this to the Lord as a small contribution for the purification of the Church, for the true renewal of the Church, and, and not lose your deep joy in the Catholic faith. No one shall take away from us our joy in the Catholic faith. On that note, Your Excellency, thank you so much for those inspiring words. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for all you are doing. And please count us at the Catholic Identity Conference among your most loyal defenders. God bless you and thank you for being with us today. I will give you a blessing to all yes. the participants. Now, yes. Dominus Vobiscum. Et benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patris et fili et spiritus sancti descendat super vos et maniat semper amen praised be jesus christ now and forever thank you your excellency thank you thank you